Welcome to this Bits of Q series on algorithms from the standard library. Today we will be talking about the copy algorithms, and for good measure we will also include move and move backward. In the last section we will even look at how you can create your own move if. So strap in and let's get going. As you probably already expected, the std copy algorithm is used to copy elements from one range to another. For example, say I have this container A containing 8 elements, and this empty container B. Now I want to copy the first three elements from A to B. I can do this by first specifying the range I want to copy from using iterators. In this case, a.begin to say I want to start copying at the beginning of A, and then I'll use a.begin plus 3 for the end of the source range. As always, when specifying ranges using iterators, the end iterator is one past the last element in the range. So this iterator pair describes this range as the source to be copied from. As the third and final argument, I specify an output iterator for the destination to copy to. In this example, b.begin. Executing this copy statement will now copy the first three elements from A to B. Now there are some restrictions when it comes to the iterator indicating the destination of the copy operation. First of all, kind of obvious, but this of course needs to be an output iterator pointing at a writable location. So if my container b would have been const, b.begin would not have been a valid iterator for the destination. The destination iterator is allowed to point to the same container as the source iterators, as long as it is not in the source range. So this is perfectly allowed and will result in the numbers 1, 2 and 3 being copied into the second part of the container. But using a.begin plus 1 for the destination, a position which lies within the range indicated by the source iterators, is not allowed. Your code will still compile and it won't crash when running, but the result will probably not be what you expect. In this case, you might expect the result of the copy operation to be something like this, with the numbers 1, 2 and 3 copied to positions with index 1, 2 and 3. But you might end up with something like this. This happens because the elements are copied one by one. First, the 1 at position 0 is copied to the output iterator, which is at position 1. The output iterator then moves to the next position, after which position 1 is read, which now contains a 1. That is copied to position 2, etc. If you do want to copy to a range that overlaps the source range, there's a different copy algorithm which we can use, and I'll get back to that in a bit. First though, let's look at a close cousin of std copy, copy n. Copy n does exactly the same as copy, but now instead of using begin and end iterators to specify the source range, you specify a begin iterator and a length. So for our original example of copying the first three elements of a to b, you could also call copy n with the parameters a.begin, 3 and b.begin. The fact that we do not have to pass an end iterator for the source range when using copy n is not just for convenience or readability. There are actually things you can do with copy n which don't work with a normal std copy. An example is using an iStream iterator to read from standard input like this. Here we use copy n to read the next three strings that are submitted through standard input, an operation that would not be possible with the normal std copy, because iStream iterator is not a random access iterator, and hence we cannot do arithmetic on it, like adding 3, to get an end iterator. If you want to know more about different iterator categories and the operations they support, check out my video on that topic. There's a link in the description. Copy n shares the same restrictions on the destination iterator as std copy. The destination should lie outside the source range. A nice way to work around this restriction is to use copy backward instead. Copy backward is similar to the normal copy in that you specify your source using an iterator range. But for the destination, we'll specify its end iterator. In contrast to the normal copy, copy backward will both read and write backwards. Let me demonstrate this. Say we again want to copy the first three elements of a to b. We again use a.begin and a.begin plus 3 for the source range, but now for the destination iterator we use b.begin plus 3, because we want the last element in the source range to end up at index 2, just like in the a container. Copy backward will now repeatedly decrement both source and destination end iterators, after which it will copy the element pointed to by the source end iterator to the destination iterator. What this means is that the order of the elements is maintained. Copy backward does not reverse the elements. It just copies them in a backward order. A result of this is that we can use copy backward 
when we want the destination range to overlap with the source range. Remember how we tried but failed to copy the elements 1, 2 and 3 to the positions with index 1 through 3? We couldn't do this with a normal SD copy, as the destination iterator needs to be outside of the input range. The same holds true for the destination iterator in copy backward. But since the copying happens backward, we can have the destination range overlap the source range. We can achieve the goal of updating our A container to the new configuration by specifying a.begin plus 4 as our destination iterator. Of course, if you think about it a bit, you'll probably realize that copy backward is merely a convenience function, as we could achieve the same thing by using reverse iterators in our normal STD copy. That being said, it's a lot easier to make mistakes when using reverse iterators. Combined with the fact that the name copy backward immediately signals to the reader of your code what the function is doing, I definitely prefer copy backward over a normal copy with reverse iterators. Both copy and copy backward also have a variant that moves elements instead of copying them. The std move and move backward. I will not demonstrate move backward, as it is literally the same thing as copy backward, except that it moves elements instead of copying them. The reason I am showing you std move is to make you aware that if you see std move with three iterators in the code, this is not the std move taking a single argument which is used to trigger move semantics. One is from the algorithms header, the other one from the utility header, and they have a very different meaning. If you want to learn more about move semantics and the role that the std move from the utility header plays in it, check out my video on move semantics. There's a link in the description. We have now covered all the unconditional copy and move algorithms. There's only one algorithm left to talk about, std copy if, which performs a conditional copy. Just like std copy, copy if takes two iterators for the source range and one for the beginning of the end range. The difference is that copy if also takes a fourth parameter, a unary predicate that can be applied to each of the elements to evaluate whether or not it should be copied. You would usually use a function pointer or a lambda for this predicate, but other callable objects are also allowed. For example, if we want to copy only those elements which are odd, we could write something like this. We use a generic lambda accepting the element by value and checking whether the value modulo 2 is equal to 1. Only when this predicate matches, an element will be copied to the destination iterator and will that iterator be incremented. The result for this example input is that only the elements 1, 3 and 5 are copied to B. Of course, we could make this code a bit more readable by creating the lambda outside of the copy if statement and giving it a proper name. Now, we talked about std move and move backward. So you might be wondering, where is move if? It turns out there is no move if. So, what if you do not have a container of integers, but your elements are big strings or other objects that are expensive to copy, and you would rather move them instead? Or maybe you're even dealing with some unique pointers, which can only be moved from. This is where iterator adapters come to the rescue. We can simulate a move if by simply using the make move iterator adapter for our input iterators. The input elements that pass the predicate will now be moved instead of copied. With some creative use of templates and forwarding, we can even create our own move if function. If you want to learn more about iterator adapters, such as make move iterator, I'm currently working on a video on this topic. Depending on when you're watching this episode, it may already appear on the screen. If you want to learn more about the other standard library algorithms and how they can make your code both faster and easier to read and maintain, check out the rest of the algorithms from the standard library playlist here. As always, make sure to subscribe for more, and I'll see you next time.